Welcome to La Trope University in Melbourne. My name is Jan Liebig and uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Kerry Howells from the University of Tasmania. Welcome, Kerry. Um, Kerry is not only a, a really uh, inspirational um, educator and uh, someone who's been a very established researcher, but she's also a practitioner. You've given many seminars uh, and, and workshops to a, a number of institutions about effective teaching and learning. Um, so we're very happy to have you. Please uh, you. make her feel uh, welcome. Um, I would also like to introduce uh, our audience. Uh, it's a mixture of my students, uh, tutors, as well as some of my colleagues. So thank you very much, uh, guys, for coming. Um, so we're here today to talk about um, you know, what we can do to actually improve the, the learning and teaching experience of both the students and, and the staff. And I think there's no one uh, better to talk about this than Kerry. I, I actually lost count of all these awards that you've <laughs> received in the last few years. Mm -hmm. At least eight since you joined uh, UC, uh, University of Tasmania in 2006, uh, yeah. I think, or something like that. So, right. I mean, what is it that makes you, that makes people uh, give you awards? <laughs> uh, what is it about your teaching? What is it that you do in classroom that, uh, that has such an impact? Yes. Um, it's a very big question and I'm hoping that that sort of unfolded during our interview but uh, just in short I think one of the things that I do is that I really um, take note of Parker J Palmer's um, philosophy which is that he's, he's written a wonderful book called The Courage to Teach and he believes that teaching cannot be reduced to technique and teaching is all about the identity and integrity of the teacher and I don't really believe about, I, I mean, I think you have to have the technique of teaching um, really down pat and, and become, make that your craft, but also one needs to look at the inner, inner dimension of what's going on. And so if my students aren't learning, the first point I go to be able to um, uh, sort of reflect on that is not the students, but myself. And so I see teaching as much about self-development as I do about development of techniques and strategies and things like that. Oh, wow. Well, this, yeah. is, this is quite radical, actually. Normally we think of, you know, getting in front of the students and just teaching them something and, and you thinking about the, the, the kind of teacher's perspective. But you yeah. have this concept of an uh, awake learner. I yeah. mean, can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, well, this concept started by me um, sitting in front of um, thousands of students I've taught in the, in the last sort of 20 years and questioning them as to whether or not they're awake because I think that students have become really good at pretending to be awake but actually their minds are a thousand miles away and I have this notion of the awake student which is one where they're totally present in their learning process so that their, their, their whole being, they bring their whole being and their whole attention to what they're studying or what, what in, in terms of the lecture. And I expect that of my students. So I say to them at the beginning of the lecture, I know when you're asleep. And even though you've got your eyes wide open, I know the difference. So they start to get really scared. And so, <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, the obvious question is why is it so important? And, and secondly, what, what is it that stops students from being awake in, in the lecture? Uh, well, I think it's really important because it's like the precondition to learning so that we spend all this money on ICT and pour billions of dollars into teaching teachers how to teach or um, teaching strategies, but we've forgotten the actual precondition for those teaching strategies to work is that the students are actually attentive enough in the learning process. So. I think we need to spend a lot of time in thinking about how we can actually get students into that awake state before we start worrying about whether or not they, they're actually able to absorb our information or absorb our content or engage in the teaching strategies. They've actually got to be awake enough to learn to start with. So, so, so let me, maybe we can use our audience here. Yeah. What, uh, what do you guys think it is that usually stops students from being awake in the, in the classes? And, you know, I'm inviting all, both the students as well as the, the teachers to give me some ideas. And I'm sure uh, Kerry will elaborate on that if we have no, yeah. no response. But can you think of what these main problems are that... Ah, because the lecture is not interactive enough. Okay, so uh, the, it can rest from the lecture. Do you think it's a part of the story? It's a part of the story. <laughs> it's only a small part of the story. What's, yeah. what's the big part then? Well, I think that um, there's two parts going on really, that the, that the 
lecturers, yes, they need to be able to teach really well and engage the students, but the students also need to make it their decision that they're going to come into the classroom as awake as possible and take responsibility for that. But I also think that students haven't necessarily learned how to be attentive, so I really believe that um, when students come to class they really want to be engaged even though they um, aren't necessarily engaged, that's not their preferred state. So by nature they want to be engaged but there's a lot that happens that shuts them down and it's about unpacking some of that with them and for them and then giving students strategies to learn how to be awake. And so students have to come into the classroom with that commitment and those strategies, but also the teachers have to take some responsibility to teach them that because they don't get that necessarily anywhere else. And I guess my, um, the kind of awakeness that I would be expecting in my pre-service teachers would be quite different perhaps to the kind of awakeness. There'd be similarities and differences in um, the kind of awakeness that you would expect in economics students because they're going off into different professions and they might have a different kind of orientation to learning. But um, I think that we can sort of both give the particular and the general um, aspects of strategies. And things. So I, I agree with, with all this baggage that we carry, carry around and, and kind of that, that prevents us from focusing on what we do and, you know, with all this computer stuff. Mm -hmm. I've actually been noticing over the last, you know, uh, eight years or so, it, it seems that students maybe they play more computer games or they use the mobile phone more and you know in those kind of environments they're always in control and they're always doing something, it's always interactive and something happens. Yeah. So it seems like uh, they, even the students who, who are genuinely interested in the subject, they, they kind of cognitively, they just can't sit for an hour and, and, and listen. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very different from, you know, 10 or 20 years ago when we didn't have that sort of distraction so we kind of grew up in, in that sort of learning environment but yeah. I think maybe do you think cognitively and the, the, the brain got kind of re rewired uh, through the technology that it's, it's harder for the students now to, to actually focus and stay awake? Yeah I do I think and that's one of the biggest concerns I have because I think that there's some research that says that um, people, just not only students, but people, people who are working out in that environment where there's a lot of email and distractions as well, can only pay attention for any long, no longer than 11 minutes. And um, so that's, you know, that, that's not even good quality attention. <laughs> that's just sort of like paying attention to a task. So we should wrap so up now. I think our audience in about a minute or so. Yeah, that, go that, to that's sleep. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm. but it is a really big, big issue of, as to how to counteract that constant distraction and that constant sort of um, movement away from the task. Because so that's how, how do you do that? I mean, what do you do? What, well, give us some practical tips of okay. how to stay away. <laughs> Yeah, um, well I think first and foremost is helping students to make the decision that that's a really important quality to have, this awakeness, and that it's required of them out in the workforce and as a parent or as somebody who's giving instructions to somebody else or receiving instructions. So you couldn't imagine a surgeon, for example, just being a bit distracted in the middle of, of this really kind of keyhole surgery, or you couldn't imagine um, you know, all the, uh, those Olympic athletes, you could see it in the, uh, their eyes, that sort of quality of awakeness. And I'm wanting my students to actually develop and really see it as their role as a student to develop that quality of awakeness that, they, that they'll probably really need, maybe concurrently in their work, but also um, in their future um, profession as well. So it's not enough to say, oh, now we live in an age of distraction, so therefore we just have to have these students like this. I think in education we've settled for far too low a level of presence in our students and we really need to raise that level of, of expectation of what we expect and so for students to come in knowing that we expect that level of presence when, when we're having this learning engagement. So that's the first step. Yeah. Now, and I, I suppose you're kind of tying it to what the lecturers do, so the level of presence of the lecturer, does it kind of somehow transfer to the student? How, how, how are these related? Yeah, I, th I think it does. Like I say to my pre-service teachers that one of the qualities of a really good teacher is teacher presence. But a person who has, a teacher has teacher presence has become really good at being present. So I think teachers and also really need to know, need to have that quality of, of presence so that just in who they are and how they are, the students are just learning a lot from them because they're so present 
in the present moment with them. And teachers' presence influences students' presence, but also teachers' expectation of students really needs, to, as I said before, really needs to be raised. And so, so what do we do? I mean, what do you do before the lecture, for example? What do you do the night yeah. before the lecture? I mean, how do you? I, I suppose we all, you know, finish up last minute stuff just and then we run off the lecture so we don't really mm. spend much time with kind of preparing ourselves mentally for the lecture and you know yeah. from experience that that can make a big difference in terms of the you know the impact of the lecture and the attentiveness of the students so what, what are yeah. your tips about what can we do before the lecture or um, well I think uh, there's, there's a number of things I think there's a, th uh, maybe I'll just first of all talk about the things that students can do and then move on to what um, teachers what teachers can do because I think students can make that decision to be in the present moment, just like I said before. But they, there's also sort of practical strategies where they they can um, keep on bringing their mind back to the, to the present moment. So keep on asking themselves, where am I now? And keep coming back, where am I now? And keep coming back. And there's something else they can do, which is to write down everything that's on their minds at the moment and, and just decide, okay, after the lecture, I'm gonna to attend to those, but during the lecture, I'm going to really focus on this lecture. And then I think that the other thing they need to recognise is that the other, the other thing that's taking their presence away is this um, inner attitude of complaint and dissatisfaction, which is what, what I experience in a lot of students. So um, students can tend to go into that victim mentality and blame the system or blame the lecturer or blame the parents or blame the lack of interest or something as, and, and sort of um, make that the reason for not being engaged. But I think if they can learn how to not complain and not to be full of complaint and dissatisfaction, that has a really, really big impact on their learning. So getting to the teachers, I think that so the so teachers... Can I just, just ask yeah. you, so are you implying that it is actually the student's responsibility to, to stay awake rather than the teacher's responsibility? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I am. But I, I also think that there's the teacher's responsibility to really expect that of them. So we have to give them the strategies and also the expectation. But I also think that the teacher's innermost attitude of complaint can also really flow to the students. So if they're full of complaint and dissatisfaction and negativity, that can really shut down students' learning without them even knowing that that's what's happening. So say, for example, um, complaining about the, the big amount of marking we've got to do and ha having this big session, big, big sort of complaint session with a colleague and then going straight into the lecture, the students can actually feel that negativity when you walk in. So I think that there's a real kind of hidden dimension to that interrelationship between the teachers in a most attitude and the students in a most attitude and, and we need to watch that. Can I actually, I yeah. mean, I should maybe mention Kerry recently wrote this um, uh, uh, fascinating book called uh, Gratitude in Education. Um, and she's she's exploring some of those uh, ideas, and and the, the the best thing about the book are the are the stories. So mm. another story that that came to mind was was this teacher Adam and how he dealt with the kind of ongoing difficult yeah. situation. I think it, it, it nicely demonstrates what you just said. So, so can you just yeah. uh, tell us the story? Yeah. Yes. So um, Adam was one of my pre-service teachers, and th what they had to do um, in first semester was go off to. Um, once a week to go off to different to this one school and come back into class and report about what they'd experienced. And Adam had um, this um, colleague teacher called Bill, who constantly complained about these three so-called ratbag boys. And these boys kept um, he, um, Bill warned Adam that these boys are going to really muck up and they're going to be really mis misbehaving and um, sort of going all over the place and he sort of rattled off a list of um, bad um, things that are going to happen if, if um, these boys don't behave. And sure enough, Adam observed these boys class after class and they were very misbehaving and really um, sort of outrageous. And then, Adam, as, and then Adam came to the end of the day where they had year eight maths class and he was kind of thinking, oh no, what are they gonna be like now? But then as, the, as these boys w walked towards this um, uh, teacher called Sophie's class, he noticed that Adam's, um, he, he noticed that, that they were really, um, ch they'd really changed and that they were really different in Sophie's class. And uh, he noticed that, that Sophie at the beginning of the class kept on thanking them for coming. 
and all the way through the class Sophie kept on saying thank you so much for what you've been doing and these boys were com completely calm in comparison to all the other classes that they've been to all the way through and at the end of the class Adam asked them um, at Adam asked Sophie what what was happening there and Sophie said I just really appreciate the fact given I know that their home life I really appreciate the fact that they've actually got out of bed and come to class so um, it was Sophie's innermost attitude of gratitude towards these boys that really m helped them be engaged and helped them pay attention. So that's a really good example, I think, of, of the innermost attitude of the teacher and the impact that has on the students because they were really outrageous all the way through the day. But as soon as they hit a teacher who was really valuing them and thanking them, it really changed. Mm. Yeah. But that, that's a really powerful concept that we kind of go beyond what, you know, this is our role as a teacher and this is what we expect from the students. And basically, you know, if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, well, it's their problem. And, and it actually mm. reminds me of this quote uh, from your book by, I think, Rachel Carson uh, about, I'm not sure if I can find it now, underneath the most annoying behavior is a frustrated person who's crying out for compassion. I and mean, I think it's quite mm. powerful when you realize that, you know, I mean, whatever bad behavior there might be from someone it may be you know they might just need help and the yes. teacher can go a, a long way in offering the yeah. offering the help so i mean you're talking about all this presence but i'm just trying to relate it to all these trends in education that we're seeing uh, things like online learning i mean how mm. do you get the teacher's presence in an online learning environment where you're just mm. sitting in front of the computer and, uh, and yeah. there's no one to no no one to talk to <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's a very complex question, um, but I, I would really probably answer that in terms of how we got to online teaching in the first place. I think that there's a real place for online teaching, um, but not to, not to replace the role of the teacher. And um, I think that there is a lot of teaching that does go on, on online, but the reason why we could even contemplate online teaching was because the presence of the teacher wasn't considered to be a really fundamental part of teaching. It was really more about information and transfer of content instead of um, all these other things that I'm talking about, which is the innermost attitude of the teacher and the presence of the teacher having a really, impact, really big impact on the student. And so because we didn't value that, it was so easy to just transfer, transfer this kind of whole notion of teaching equals transfer of information onto online teaching. But I think we've lost a lot. And I think the other thing is about um, my concept of gratitude is that whatever we don't value in education, we lose. So we didn't value the teacher enough or we didn't value that aspect of teaching. So because we didn't show our gratitude and our appreciation for it publicly, we lost it. So how, how do we value the teachers? I mean, there's all this, um, all this debate about uh, compensation, teacher compensation. Should mm. we try to attract them through better compensation schemes and reward the, the more quality teacher better? Mm. Or what's the, what's the key thing that, that would attract good quality teachers and you know, would be happy to stay and, yeah. and, and contribute to our kids' learning? What, well, I think that most of the teachers that I've worked with, and, I, and the research is bearing this out as well, is that what really matters for teachers is relationships. And really good quality relationships rely on them being valued and that there's a culture of value and appreciation in the school. So if you go into a school or a university where your dean or your, your um, principal really values you and knows how to express that value, then that's a really good school. And you can really tell just from the moment you meet the principal of a school, the kind of um, quality of the school is all gonna flow down from the really? attitude of that principal. I mean, you've been to many. Yeah, so, okay. yeah I, I really believe that. That's so in the work that I do, I spend a lot of time, first of all, working with school leaders and then teachers and then students. So I start with the, the kind of leadership first. And so I think teachers really need to feel valued and, and they need to have, an opportunity to have really good quality relationships and there's so much more of an emphasis on busyness and t getting tasks done and um, meeting performance objectives that the relationship gets lost and because of that there's just not enough of that sort of quality relationship or connection between students and teachers or teachers and teachers. So sometimes there's sort of feeling that it's so robotic or so much high pressure and so busy that we forget as teachers, we forget that that connection between another human being is really important.
Mm. So are you saying that that's kind of more valuable to the teachers than the financial? Yeah, I think you're talking uh, to an economist. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to convince well, me. Well, there's teachers in the audience. You should ask what them. Do, what do you guys, but I think I mean, of course, we have to be paid enough, but it's not enough. I don't think. What do you think? Is, are there relationships? Is, is it a point that you would agree with? Uh, I think it's not a coincidence that um, there are very high numbers of academic staff are lead, lead, leaving universities. And that correlates also with um, widespread literature on the fact that collegiality is fading yeah. in universities everywhere mm -hmm. because there's not enough time. That's right. Yeah. So there's same. There's there's my there's my point. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So let's let's think. I mean, I I would agree very much with you that this, you know, the the attitude of the um, of the teacher as well as the student has a has a big impact on on the learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's explore some of those other strategies or some of the other problems that you find uh, are stopping students from you know, learning effectively. Um, mm. I should actually say that uh, we met a long time ago uh, when I was doing my PhD at the University of New South Wales and uh, Kerry was, uh, I was very lucky to be able to uh, be a part of a, a process where we were designing and, and implementing these transition workshops uh, for, for f kind of first year students. Yeah. Can you tell a little bit about that? Just, uh, you know, what, what they were about, what, what was yeah. the idea? Well, I think that the first thing was about the awake student, wasn't it, still right back then. And um, there's kind of like physical strategies that we can teach them just about, um, you know, drinking more water because water is really important. So water and nutrition and, and posture, st putting our, our backs up straight against the chair because the oxygen, yes, everybody in the audience <laughs> I'm noticing, um, the, our, our oxygen goes from our backbones to our heads and so uh, into our brains and so therefore posture is really important and these little things seem to be sort of so trivial but if, if students are trying to study and they're dehydrated, they're not going to be able to be awake enough so there's kind of like the basic things but there's also sort of strategies in regards to um, overcoming some of the really um, kind of common issues which is around procrastination for example and um, t you know working out um, how to work out their time and learning strategies and things like that. So, yeah. so what, what about procrastination? Uh, well I, I think that there's a lot to be said about what emotional intelligence says about procrastination which is that most of our decision making around what we're going to do is based on how we feel rather than a rational thinking process because if it was a rational thinking process we would just naturally do what we think we should do but the thing that gets in the way all the time is is our emotions so um, the whole theory behind emotional intelligence is that we need to be intelligent about our emotions and use that productively so focusing on what it's going to feel like at the end of the task and really keeping that feeling in the present moment. So, for example, um, you have to do an essay and you ask yourself, do I feel like doing it? And you often say, no, I don't feel like doing it. I feel like going out with my friends. And so therefore you go out your, with your friends because you, I can see some students going, yeah, yeah, in the audience. So you, should, so, you, you shouldn't even ask the question. You shouldn't even ask that question. Just focus on what it's going to feel like to complete that essay or what's, what it's going to feel like if I've given a couple of hours study. It's going to be feel really good compared to going off with my friends. So focusing on the end well, result. It depends on the feeling. amount of drinking that you do. It, it does. It really depends <laughs> on it. <laughs> well, I, I think I should apply it to uh, vacuuming, you know. It's my uh, least mm. favourite activity, but maybe if I uh, focus on the, you know, on how, how nice and clean it will all look and how... Uh, how satisfied my wife will be. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly that, how the principle works. That'll help me to, do I understand it correctly? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what other issues? Um, um, I remember we talked about uh, big picture and detail uh, yeah. in the transition workshop. So yeah, that's that's one of the most fundamental um, learning strategies that my students keep coming back to as being the most important because there's a lot around about learning strategies. But I think the one that really um, makes practical and very, very significant sense is working out whether or not you're a big picture person or a detail person and 
to work out um, the gap between um, what the lecturer is expecting of you or what the course is expecting of you and your preferred way of orientating yourself. So say for example, prob probably the audience has already noticed I'm a very big picture person and you keep on having to ask me the details <laughs> because my general orientation isn't towards the, the details but I know as a good lecturer I need to focus on both the big picture and details so I can actually capture all my students. And so often there's a mistaken um, sort of idea that I, I'm not just not getting this subject or I'm not good enough to study this th at this university or not good enough to study this subject. Be but it's not really that, it's more that there's this gap there between your preferred way of studying the information and the way it's being expected or taught to you. So, so kind of working out that gap is really So, so what, what should a student do if there's a mismatch between what he needs or he or she needs yeah. and what the lecturer is providing? Uh, uh, find it themselves. So if, if there's a lecturer who's really detailed and in economics you wouldn't have this problem I don't think because it's sort of, it, it's all, I think there's something to be said about um, the kind of orientation of certain disciplines as well. But if you have a lecturer who is very, um, you know, particular in giving lots and lots of details, but as a student you don't have the big picture and that's what you need, then you can either go and ask the, ask the lecturer for the big picture or you can start looking for it yourself in terms of doing wider reading or asking questions mm. about, th about that that kind of generates answers towards the big picture as well. Okay, um, surface versus deep approach. Can you, uh, that was one of the other themes. Yes. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's, that's a very common way now in which, or, um, it, was, it sort of happened a couple of, uh, about a, over a decade ago of ways in which we describe university learning and teaching so that um, students who are studying just for information and only getting through and getting out are considered to be surface learners and those who really study for the deep understanding of the subject matter so that they can really apply that to a future situation. They're considered to be deep approach learners. So we can actually help students to learn how to approach their studies in that way, mm. in different ways. Yeah, I, this is, I, I find that the kids that are coming out of high schools, that it's very much a surface learning. It's all memorizing, mm. it's all rote learning. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, how, how do we change that? It's kind change of very the system. Hard <laughs> change what's expected of them in in um, assessment and change the pressure of of having to kind of regurgitate information and all that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, and make it enjoyable. Yeah. Um, Stephen Coey's uh, kind of suggestion to put the important before before the urgent. Yes. Can you can you talk about this? I find it yeah. a very powerful. It is very powerful. I, it's very powerful because I don't, I'm not very good at it, <laughs> so I have to learn it myself um, all the time. So thank you for reminding me of it. But I, I, I think that um, it's very powerful because he's saying that too many of us are addicted to urgency and it's kind of related to procrastination as well, so that we wait and wait and wait until the, the task is absolutely due before we actually um, make, I can see students smiling about this as well, um, make, make the effort to actually do something about it. And, and he's saying that we can't really function like that and nor can we have a really balanced life if we keep becoming addicted to urgency. And students really need to learn how to break this habit while they're students so that they don't keep transferring this into their workplace because it's not going to help them to be addicted to urgency when they're working in really high pressure environments. So his whole philosophy is that you make a list of what, um, what's important at the beginning of the, the week and what's urgent and do the important things before the urgent even though it's kind of counterintuitive. And um, he's saying that the more you pay attention to the important things, the more that the, they, the, the, the your list of urgent won't become very big. So an example of important might be, um, you know, contacting your parents or um, doing that essay when it's due sort of a week before or um, paying your car registration a, couple, a month before it's due or a couple of weeks before it's due. And then when they, those things become urgent, they really can kind of interrupt your life, especially your car, car registrations one week overdue and the policeman pulls you over or something like that. So it's about sort of giving priority to the urgent, uh, to the important before the urgent. It's, yeah. um, I mean, from what you, uh, the, the themes you, you, you're raising, it, it overlaps a little bit with this theme of uh, student-centered approach. Mm. Uh, but I suppose you'd see some distinctive features. So what, 
So what did, uh, and I, I remember from your book that you were highlighting some of the possible downsides of yeah. student-centered approach. So what, what yeah. are they? Well, I, I think we're kind of caught, this is like it gets back to a bigger question about education, I think, Jan, because um, I think we're caught in the grip of a very stagnant notion of education where we have, you know, to, to be a true dynamic, if you look at anything that is in the process of a dynamic, you have a giving and receiving relationship. So um, I think education is kind of really stuck at the moment and it has been for quite some time, which is why it's kind of reaching this kind of boiling point where um, the, t the teacher is kind of very much entrenched in the, in the role of giver. And, and not really um, trained or kind of educated to look for what they receive from their students or receive from their, their institution. And the, the student is very much kind of um, um, compartmentalised into the receiver. And so especially if they're paying high hex fees or um, you know, being treated as a client, they, they consider themselves as um, clients or we consider them as clients so they're very much entrenched in the whole kind of realm of receiver but there's not that kind of really healthy flow between giver and receiver and so I think one of the things we need to do is actually turn that around and that's what my gratitude work is trying to do where the teachers are open to what they receive and they want to give back because they receive so much and there's less burnout and, and less kind of like stress because they So what receiving. exactly are we receiving as, as teachers or what, what is it that we should be looking for that we're receiving uh, without even realising it? Uh, yeah, I just think the whole kind of ability to teach and, the, and what we receive from our students and learning from our students and the fact that we have a job in, in, um, in a really sort of in, in a country that is sort of giving us so many opportunities and um, seeing what, what opportunities that we've been given and the actual sort of even our kind of physical capacity to teach. There's endless amounts of areas that we can look at to see what we receive rather than what we give. But I don't think it's necessarily teachers' fault. It's just that we're kind of very entrenched in those kind of um, ways. And so getting back to this question about um, the student-centeredness, I think student-centered learning is fantastic because it kind of takes away from this whole notion of teacher giving to this empty cup. But I think we've taken it far too far where it's all about the students, but not necessarily about asking the students to give back in some ways or for the students to really think about ways in which they can not only be receiving, but giving and for, for kind of opening up the whole opportunities for students to give back in some ways. So there are some initiatives around like service learning and other kinds of things where, teach, where students are encouraged to be givers, but it needs to be not so constructed and, and, and be part of a course. It needs to be much more of that that's what we're expecting of them and that they really want to be giving. So student-centeredness, if it's not expecting them to give back in some ways, is kind of a bit damaging, I think, to them. And that's a radical view, maybe. That's why I call my book a radical view. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is. I mean, it's. I think the, the notion that uh, if we are, are kind of more grateful for what we receive has a positive impact on, you know, mm. on our life and our relationship uh, relationships. That's. That's. I think this, there's actually some scientific evidence that you know your expectations matter. But but yeah. you're basically saying that it's also a powerful educational tool. Yes. That you know both the students and the, and the teachers, if they're kind of more grateful uh, uh, for for the whole experience, they basically it leads to much better learning outcome for the students. Yeah. And I think that's that's a relatively that's that struck me as a very noble noble mm -hmm. thing in your book. So it yeah. really made me kind of think more carefully about what I was bringing to the lectures and how I was you know thinking of the mm -hmm teacher-student relationship. There's some amazing stories in your book. I, I always think of Joseph, the, mm. the refugee in this, in this respect. Can you, can yes. you tell that story? Is yeah. That, uh, um, that was a really, really moving experience for me. Just listen, I was at a gathering and um, it was a gathering where refugees were being, were asked, to, were in Tasmania were invited to come and tell some of their stories. And Joseph just got up and he was this, this sort of very calm, beautiful man and he, he talked about having been in refugee camps since he was four years old and um, he'd experienced a massive genocide in Rwanda and, and um, it, you know, watched, watched his um, whole family be obliterated and 
there in the camp there are a lot of really depressed um, refugees and they've gone from refugee camp to refugee camp and um, one day they just decided that they couldn't keep going in this really depressed state so they decided to, to start um, looking at the gifts that they thought that they could give to their community and start sharing them so they started to share um, the, some of the things that they thought that they could give to the community and when they started to do this they started to appreciate each other and a lot more and they started to be a lot more optimistic and happy and then they started to actually share these gifts and then they decided that they had enough gifts amongst them to start a school so that in the refugee camp that kind of sharing of what I can give in the end ended up being um, part of the education they were going to give to their children because they realised that one person can teach sewing and another person can teach gardening and another person can teach something else. So instead of being in this kind of really depressed state of what, I, what has happened to me, they started to turn it around to what I can give to my community and that's when they started to really, their whole well-being started to improve and the well-being of the community started to improve. And then he basically concluded by this really powerful line. Yeah. Uh, what did he say? Right. My, my suffering is my treasure, my, I think. My suffering is my greatest treasure, yes. And I, yeah. and I, I just thought it was so powerful because mm. it, it makes you pause and think, you know, you're kind of constantly complaining about, you know, not having this and about that. And then mm. you you see someone who, whose life has been so terrible and mm. they could still you know, reflect on it and, and see the, the bright side of it and see how much it helped them to get whatever, you know, wherever they got. I think it's, uh, it's really, you know, mm. we kind of have to remind ourselves that this is yes. what we you know, need and, to do. And I notice that, and the audience probably here notices, and you probably do, Jan, too, that, you, that we do get a certain percentage of our students who are really awake in our classes and often the story behind their awakeness is some kind of story of um, misfortune or a story of, of not having what they, what they now have and because they now have something that they never thought they would have like the refugees in some of my classes are the most awake and so are the mature age, many of the mature age students who have really wanted an ache to get an education for many years and they've been at home with their kids or they've been doing some work that's been a bit meaningless and now, now they can start to do what they really want to do and there's like every moment is, is a real treasure for them like Joseph was saying and that kind of appreciation you can see it and just transfer the, th take the theory from that like what is it about them that's so awake that isn't in these other students and it is these stories of I didn't have and now I do and so I'm really valuing my education and, and that, that quality of awakeness comes from that gratitude which is you know it's sort of like quite evident really. Mm. Yeah. Now uh, let me just see whether our audience uh, is still awake. Um, <laughs> I think we, uh, in a few minutes I'm going to pass it over uh, to your questions. But let me just, I mean, in this gratitude work it seems, uh, it, it kind of overlaps with, with this positive thinking. Uh, mm. So is it, is it the same thing? I just, you know, kind of mm. program myself to be happy all the time? Or how does yeah. that? Uh, no, it's the exact opposite of that. Oh wow. It is. Like, like um, I understand why gratitude can be aligned with positive thinking because when you are grateful there, there is that sense of being more positive but gratitude has necessarily a relationship with another person so that you can't have gratitude without expressing that gratitude to someone else. So for me it starts out with appreciation but it doesn't become complete gratitude until it's an action of some kind where you're giving back to someone for what you have received. Whereas positive thinking can be very individualistic and you can just think positively and replace one negative thought with a positive thought but that's just like putting a positive veneer over a negative situation and it can be quite destructive. So gratitude is really, really different to that. It's sort of like an acknowledgement and then an action. It's a very different kind of process and plus I talk about gratitude as a practice rather than um, a way of thinking. So, so. it's not that you you just decide and you become more grateful and you no. start seeing things as a gift and all this. How do you, so how do you practice that? No, I think, it, well, it's just more that, I think everybody has an element of gratitude in their lives. It's not like I'm coming along saying with this brand new thing, but it's about, as a practice, it's about choosing one thing that 
you would like to practice gratitude more towards one person or one lecture or one textbook, for example, and really practicing with just that one thing for a period of time until it becomes a habit and then moving on to the other thing. <clears throat> and as a result of really focusing on that one thing, the sort of circle of gratitude kind of, you know, emulates from that. So have you have you ever struggled with uh, with your practice of gratitude? Like have you ever oh, no, I'm, fallen I'm into perfect. this complacency? I'm perfect, perfect practitioner of gratitude. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, That's no, not the book no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually started writing my book for about, about the first two years as as an expert, and I and then I saw had sort of why it was so hard to write it like that because it was so hideously opposite to what was really going on. So I started to put myself into that situation and recognise to my reader that gratitude is actually an, a lovely ideal, but it's a really, really hard thing to acquire. And every day I have every, not only just once a day, but many times a day, I, I fall down on my gratitude, but it's not really about having gratitude all the time. That's not really what this is about. It's about really kind of having that as a yardstick to recognise that as a teacher, it's like an ethic of gratitude that, that um, as a teacher, I know my students will learn much more effectively if I bring gratitude to that learning and teaching situation and to really make that part of who I am as much as I can, um, just with little practices rather than feeling great gratitude all the time. Yeah. Okay, so let me maybe hand, hand it over to the audience would you guys like to ask about anything, Stefan? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Um, maybe a bit of a challenging question. Now, living in a time where obviously institutions are getting rid of a lot of mm. academics, um, where the classrooms get bigger and where particularly tutors, so the um, casual workforce, is not getting paid for consultation or mm. for anything outside this one hour of tutorial with a bit of time yeah. associated to that. Um, and given that you have portrayed, I find, a sp particular kind of student that I believe or I agree with you that it is most on the student to recognize all those things but we're already telling them what we expect of them so we're quite clear on this subject learning guides at least the first tutorials the first lectures they know exactly this is what we want from you you're supposed to be tentative we might not go into as much detail about drinking water but <laughs> we we're trying to tell them all of this and I agree with you that we should spend a lot of time with them but so I'm asking you now, as a tutor myself, yeah. what is the practical thing that I can take away with it? And I'm not sure I believe that saying to my students for an hour, thank you for being here, mm. is what also prepares them for the workforce, where an employer might not say that to them every day. Mm. So could, you, could I hear your thoughts on yeah. maybe that? Yeah, there's a lot of questions in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. no, that's good, yeah. Um, well, th let's, let's just take the first one about the current climate um, of the university because we're suffering exactly the same at the University of Tasmania and I don't think there's a university around Australia that isn't suffering under the weight of the ca over casualization of the workforce and, and being expected to do too much plus losing a lot of colleagues around us. <clears throat> and I, I think that we lose a lot if we allow that situation to put us into the state of being a victim and um, carry on with a lot of victim mentality where we have, where we feel totally powerless in the situation. So um, I think one of the things that we can, we do have power over is our attitude towards that and we, um, to see how destructive to our health and to our sense of collegiality that an inner attitude of that victim mentality is going to going to do, then we, we need to sort of take hold of something that we do have control over and the thing that I think we have a lot of control over is our attitude to that and what, what we're going to, to do about that. And then the second thing is I didn't really want to portray a very simplistic view of what we do with our students because a lot of the time I don't, you know, I, yes I do think that strategies are really important but um, uh, it's not so much about our expectations of them that's going to really change them as much as our valuing them as people and as um, our relationships with them and then with our relationships with our colleagues. So if I think, I, I, if I could think of one take home thing that you could do, I think it would be to value relationships rather than tasks. So that um, at the moment we're under this whole pressure about performance and performance objectives but that's really scary with where that goes into the classroom and what that looks like in the classroom of just 
getting in and getting out and churning out students and churning out grades and marking as quickly as we can because we're just drowning underneath the weight of what's expected of us. And I would, I would sort of really bring it back to, um, you know, what kind of relationship do I have with my students? And that's what really counts for our students' learning because if students have a strong relationship with their tutor, they will learn. But if the tutor's just in there to go and just kind of go and perform, they won't learn, they'll shut down. So may as well not be there. May as well be along in that long list of people who are leaving. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a short answer to a <laughs> complex question. <laughs> Anyone else can think of it? Scott. Hi there. Um, I have a question around multicultural learning environments. Yeah. And what in, especially in relation to this idea of being awake, mm -hmm. how or what have you found? Um, in terms of the differences in cultures on that? Um, I think that there's, there's two, two main answers to that question. The first one is that the international students, I know there's a few of them here, so they'd probably be able to answer more clearly than I would. They find this a little bit harder to take because they're used, to, they, they come into the learning environment really wanting just to get it, just to get the material and to really focus on what's expected and to have really clear boundaries around that. So sometimes my awakeness kind of takes them off on a tangent. They want to keep getting back to the tangent. And, and then it's not until they start sort of struggling with the amount of work that they've got going on that that can be relevant. So if I was to only have international students, it would be the timing that I would bring this to them. Um, and, and it might be um, linking it more to their culture and what they know about. The second thing is about gratitude though um, and its relationship where a lot of students from uh, um, international students know this much more than I do or much more than we do because it's part of their culture, it's part of um, how they've been brought up is to respect their teacher and to express that gratitude. Um, perhaps in an over, it's become over -rich ritualized and it, that needs to be unpacked as well. Um, but they feel more at home and more comfortable in environments where the teacher is, where, where students are expressing more gratitude to their students because that's what they have been brought up to expect. And I know that from having taught for a year in Thailand where there's so, much, so many layers of expressing gratitude to the teacher that when those kinds of, when Thai students, for example, come to Australia, it's very disorienting the kind of lack of respect or lack of gratitude that is in place. And so they feel, they go, oh yeah, I, re I remember this from, from my culture. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to ask you about uh, the future, uh, if I can, because you've got mm -hmm. some uh, projects coming up. Uh, what are you focusing, what are you focusing on? Uh, well, my next project after my book is that I'd really love to um, focus on PhD students and uh, the supervisor supervision experience because I did some work at ANU and at UNSW with PhD students looking at this whole interrelationship between thinking and thanking. That's, uh, that's Heidegger, I think. Uh, yes, it's Martin Heidegger, yeah, and, and, and not only Martin Heidegger, but in, in um, he, what he's highlighting is this etymological link between thinking and thanking, so that thinking and thanking came from the same word, which was thonk. And so what I'm, I'm sort of extrapolating from that by saying that when we, thi when we, when we thank while we think, we think better. So that the, there's sort of like this interrelationship between that. So I'm saying that I'm wanting to research PhD students and look at whether or not, if they're in a state of gratitude while they're studying and in their relationship with their supervisors, which is quite a complex relationship of giving and receiving at a sort of different level, that to, to investigate whether or not that has, that has an impact on their thinking process. So that's my new little project. And what, so you're trying to make sure that the, you know, the, there's an improved well-being of PhD students mm -hmm. or you know, lower dropout rates? Lo lower this? dropout rates, yeah. Um, higher completion rates, but most importantly, once again, that the relationship between, that they, they have a functional relationship with their supervisor because often there's that power dynamic and um, there's not necessarily the skills needed to negotiate when things are complex or when they need some more help or when they aren't getting the kind of help that they need. So working out strategies to actually 
um, not necessarily only about gratitude, but learning about what lack of gratitude, what ingratitude does, and to and to have them investigate strategies for that. Mm, that's, mm. I think that'll be very valuable. So I think uh, I have to con we have to conclude because our time is up. Mm. But um, thank you again very very much for coming coming out and and uh, sharing your insights uh, that I'm sure we'll all take to the classroom and hopefully it'll improve our learning and teaching experience. Mm -hmm. So if you can please join me in thanking Kerry for very mm -hmm. interesting <laughs> thoughts. Okay. And, and uh, we'd like to wish you, uh, wish you all the best for, for all your future projects and hopefully we'll get to work together again yeah. sometime while you, you, you come and work with our PhD students. That'd be wonderful, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Kerry. you.